Paul Manafort on trial, the mysterious story behind the Novacek poisonings, and the NRA takes a stand against Florida's new gun laws. All this and more on this edition of Truth is Making a Comeback. Truth is Making a Comeback. America's Top Stories with Lisa K. Donner. The jury is seated in a Virginia federal courtroom in the high stakes trial of Paul Manafort. President Trump's former campaign manager is facing charges of tax evasion and bank fraud. But thus far, nothing has surfaced in Manafort's case regarding the Russians. Mueller claims to turn up the heat on Manafort to get him to play ball in the so-called Trump-Russian collusion investigation. In a harsh rebuke to Mueller's team back in May, federal judge T.S. Ellis III said he was concerned about the prosecution of Manafort. Quote, The vernacular is to sing, to turn the screws and get the information you really want. Will Manafort play ball? Does he really have anything to sing about? Joining us today is Liberty Nation's chief political columnist, Tim Donner, no relation, with more on the Manafort trial. Tim, is there even a shred of evidence that suggests that Manafort has something to sing about? Well, perhaps the thing that Manafort has to sing about is that is that infamous meeting that he sat in on at uh, Trump Tower between Donald Trump Jr. and that Russian woman promising dirt on Hillary Clinton during the presidential campaign. But that may be a dead horse. It's been examined by special counsel Robert Mueller from every angle, and there's no evidence that we know of indicating that the promise of dirt was, was anything more than a head fake by that Russian woman to lobby for a change Uh, in a law that the Russians don't like. And the reality is that politics is a dirty game and people offering political candidates dirt on their opponents probably happens a hundred times a day during the uh, election season. Could perchance Mueller have a political motivation for prosecuting Manafort? Well, that's what the judge in this case, T.S. Ellis, already stated. Uh, that going after Manafort was just another way for the special counsel to take down the president of the United States. Even though we have no indication that Manafort has anything on Trump, which he could use as leverage to keep himself out of prison for a, a very long time. The government is using Manafort's consulting partner, Rick Gates, as leverage against Manafort. Gates already pleaded guilty to similar charges, and he's cooperating with the government. He's their star witness. So on one hand, this is a political prosecution, of course, by what many are calling a fourth branch of government because a special counsel has such broad powers. But on the other hand, a special counsel can hardly just ignore any crimes he may uncover in the course of an unrelated investigation. As one who follows these things closely, uh, what do you suspect are the possible outcomes in this case? There are many possible outcomes, depending on what kind of dirt uh, they get on Manafort or already have from Rick Gates and others, including, by the way, the Democrat political consultant, Tad Devine, who testified on the first day of the trial. The prosecution has 35 witnesses lined up, so it appears they may have a mountain of evidence that Manafort evaded millions of dollars in taxes while he indulged in a jet-set lifestyle, paying millions in cash for uh, homes in the United States and all manner of expensive goods like a $21,000 watch and a $15,000 jacket. And it also depends on whether the jury of six men and six women views this as a political prosecution or legitimate charges that warrant Mr. Manafort spending possibly the rest of his life in prison. That's Liberty Nation's Tim Donner reporting from Washington. This week on LibertyNation.com, UK-based correspondent Laura Volkovic wrote a fascinating three-part series about the mysterious Novichok poisonings in Great Britain. The series, titled The Poison, The Players, and the government cover-up proved to be very popular and revealed some rather odd coincidences. Without being too conspiratorial, Laura discusses the poisonings of Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia, as well as two ordinary British citizens, Don Sturgis and Charlie Rowley. While Sturgis died, 
The other three remain alive and hidden in the UK. Laura joins us now with the latest. Can you give us the status on the three victims that are still alive? No one really knows where they are. Um, the, the Scree pals are kind of hidden away somewhere. The daughter, Yulia, made a one uh, recorded public appearance and a statement that was released by the police on her behalf. Um, and one of the people poisoned by accident is being kept isolated in a police safe house uh, with no real access to the outside world. Laura, do you believe that the UK government is actually involved in a cover-up? The UK government kind of jumped straight to the conclusion that Russia was the only possible um, a country to blame for these poisonings. But there seem to be a lot of details that don't make a lot of sense. Um, for example, why are these be, um, victims being uh, kept away from the public? Uh, and what other countries had access to these um, chemical weapons? There's just a lot of things that don't really add up about it. Well, it does seem like Russia is to blame for everything these days, doesn't it? There is evidence that several other countries had access to samples of Novichok or were aware of how to formulate it, um, including Iran, Germany, Holland, uh, the Czech Republic, the UK, and even the US, uh, which we know because WikiLeaks put out some documents from Hillary Clinton's State Department showing that she instructed diplomats to uh, pretend they didn't know about it. I'm wondering if there are any U.S. connections that you might have uncovered. Sergei Skripal, who is a former Russian spy, is thought to have links to Christopher Steele, who was a former British spy uh, and is thought to have written the, the, the dossier claiming President Trump colluded with the Russians to win the election. Um, Skripal's friend and his former handler at MI6, called Pablo Miller, is thought to have worked for Steele's company, um, Orbis Business Intelligence, which was subcontracted sub by Fusion GPS, the American company, uh, to write the dossier about Trump. So the, the connection is not uh, concrete, but it would have to be a major coincidence for these two political incidences to do with Russia in such close proximity. Um, the Novichok poisoning and the collusion scandal to involve the same group of uh, a small number of former spies um, around Russia and the UK. So at this point, it's all very mysterious. And that's Liberty Nation's Laura Valkovic reporting from Great Britain. Hand over the gun. Those orders have been issued to hundreds of gun owners in Florida since their new strict firearm policy went into effect this year. The new legislation was swiftly passed after the high school shooting in Parkland, Florida. Now the NRA is saying enough. They are suing the state of Florida, arguing that the new law is a blatant violation of the Second Amendment. Joining us now is our Second Amendment specialist, James Fight. Jim, does the NRA really have a leg to stand on here? Well, they certainly should. Uh... The Second Amendment, as I've read it, is pretty clear. Uh, and unless there's an, an unabridged version somewhere that includes the uh, the accept clauses for who can have guns, what guns, and when it's okay to infringe that right, then uh, Florida is clearly in violation of the Second Amendment. Of the seizure requests, how many have been actually denied by Florida judges? Well, so far, uh, it doesn't seem that any have been denied. And I think that absolutely is an issue. We're not talking about people who have been convicted or for that matter, even accused of an actual crime. Uh, these are just people that someone said, hey, this person's dangerous. Maybe they said or did something that was taken to be dangerous. Uh, and now there are gun confiscation orders and people are losing their rights. And it could be something as simple as something you hear in the South, especially a lot. You know, the day they outlaw guns is the day I'll become an outlaw or if they come after my guns, they'll get the bullets or some other little saying like that. You know, I wonder how many of these confiscation orders are because of that. 
If the NRA wins this, do you think this will give other states pause before they enact this kind of legislation? The Second Amendment itself should give other states pause, but failing that, hopefully that the NRA winning this lawsuit, which seems fairly inevitable to me, hopefully that will give them pause, and I think it would. Every time uh, a new gun control measure is passed and, and those of us who are against them cry out, hey, you're just trying to take our guns, we're accused of making a slippery slope fallacy. Well, this is, I mean, yet every time when we say, well, this is going to lead to this, no, no, that's a slippery slope. And then sure enough, now here we are. We have gun confiscations from people who haven't even committed a crime. Uh, how many times can you cry out slippery slope fallacy without actually acknowledging that, yeah, it's a slippery slope and we're sliding right down it. That's Liberty Nation's James Fight reporting from the wilds of Arkansas. And now for my parting shot of the week. I've long held to the parenting theory that when you take away something from a child or young adult, it becomes forbidden fruit and only makes it more desirable. You tell a kid not to watch TV, what's the first thing he wants to do in his spare time? Tell a kid no more candy and you'll spend your life at the dentist filling cavities. Such is the case with changing the age to own a long rifle from 18 to 21 for Florida kids. Of course, there are the obvious reasons, like they can go into the military at 18 and learn everything there is to know about guns, but not be able to buy one as an ordinary citizen. But there are other very sound reasons as well. First, it really does violate the Second Amendment. Secondly, it makes playing around with rifles forbidden and likely hidden fruit from their parents. My brother got his first 22 when he was 13 years old, and he's had a lifelong love affair with firearms ever since. But it was my father that taught him how to shoot. It wasn't something illegal that he had to hide. Learning a healthy respect for guns begins in the home. Additional restrictions are not the answer. The NRA has a right to sue the state of Florida, and there is no other organization in America that does more to advance the cause of gun safety than the NRA. They have myriad classes for young people and offer tons of education in the proper handling of firearms. And the NRA does need a win here in the state of Florida. If not, state legislatures will be passing more and more of these restrictions, and that would be a travesty to those of us who hold the Second Amendment near and dear to our hearts and to our fundamental rights and liberties as American citizens. And that's my parting shot. Coming up on LibertyNation.com this week, watch for Bill Crystal for president. Really? A new series on Saul Alinsky's 12 rules and how the left is taking them to heart. Shadow banning, is it real or imagined? Bernie goes broke, literally. All this plus Ellen TV interviews with our authors, Ellen Radio, and the Uprising podcast. So stay tuned to LibertyNation.com where truth is making a comeback. I'm Lisa K. Donner. Thanks so much for watching. Truth is making a comeback. Visit us at LibertyNation.com.